human papilloma virus is sexually transmitted infection and this type of viral infection is associated with the cervical vaginal anal penile as well as nasopharyngeal cancers so here what I'm going to do is that first I will talk about the pathophysiology of the HPV infection and how it can increase the risk of the cervical cancer and then after that discuss different vaccines that are available for HPV, the recommended timing for vaccination and then finally discuss the recommended timing for the cervical cancer screening. So human papillomavirus is divided into two different subtypes. The high-risk subtype, which comprises the HPV 16, 18, 31, and 33. And in fact, HPV 16 and 18 accounts for 70% of the cases of cervical cancers as well as anal cancers. And then there is also a low-risk subtype like HPV 6 and 11, which account for 90% of the cases of genital wart or condyloma acuminata which is the other name for it and the genital wart has a very low chance of progression into the squamous cell carcinoma now as for pathophysiology of the hpv infection and how it can cause cancer hpv produces two different oncogenic proteins the e6 protein which binds to the p53 tumor suppressor gene and causes its degradation as a consequence of which now there is decreased rate of apoptosis that can cause accumulation of mutations increase cell proliferation and eventually cause cancer likewise e7 protein can bind to the retinal blastoma as a consequence of which it will allow cells to proceed into the cell cycle despite the presence of mutations and so therefore damaged cells can continue into the cell cycle increase proliferation and eventually cause cancer due to the accumulation of mutations and so given that hpv can cause cancer in both males and females it's recommended for both males and females to be vaccinated with the hpv vaccine so there are different forms of the hpv vaccine the bivalent quadrivalent and nine valent vaccines and so you can see the subtypes that are included in every one of these vaccines so if cost and availability is not an issue then it's recommended to proceed with the nine valent vaccine and the timing for vaccination is 11 to 12 years of age but then patients can be vaccinated as early as nine years of age and the catch-up vaccine can be provided up to 26 years of age in patients who have not been previously vaccinated now as for the risk factor to the cervical cancer early onset of sexual activity multiple sexual partners multiparity and history of std so basically all of these are telling you that increased sexual activity which increases the risk of HPV infection are associated with increased risk of cervical cancers. And then the other risk factors include the HIV infection as well as low socioeconomic status. Now here it shows you the steps through which the normal epithelium of the cervix can progress into cervical cancer. So here on the top layer, you can see that there is normal epithelium. Then we have the basement membrane shown right there. And then underneath that we have the muscle. So dysplasia is a step before cancer and dysplastic cells have changes in size, shape, and orientation. They have increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio as well as increased mitotic figures. And then one other finding that is associated with the HPV infection is the presence of coelocytes. Where the nucleus has a raisinoid shape and then there is a perinuclear halo. So if you look under histology where there is this pink background, you will see a nucleus with a raisinoid shape and then there is a perinuclear halo. And this is characteristics of coelocytes which is seen with the HPV infection. In any case, as for the steps through which the normal cervical epithelium can progress into cervical cancer, so first, up to one third of the epithelium can become dysplastic. And this is considered a CIN1 or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia 1. So this is a mild form of dysplasia. If up to two thirds of the epithelium is covered, then it's a moderate dysplasia or CIN2. And if the entire thickness 
of the epithelium is covered, then it's a severe dysplasia or CIN3. And since the entire thickness of the epithelium is covered, but then the underlying basement membrane and the um, muscle are not invaded yet, therefore the other name that some people sometimes refer to as CIN3 or severe dysplasia is carcinoma in situ. And then cancer develops as cells start attacking the basement membrane and the muscle and then from here on they can um, metastasize to different sites. Now to screen for cervical cancers there are different tests. One you can check for the HPV subtypes to look for the high risk groups like for instance HPV 16 and 18 to check the risk of cervical cancer. And then the other test that you can use is the pap smear where you obtain cells from the transformation zone which is the junction between the ecto and endo cervix. So in fact the dysplastic cells and cancers are developing from the junction point between the ecto and endo cervix. And so by obtaining cells from this area we would be able to analyze them under histology to see if there are any dysplastic changes. So again the common changes that we are looking for includes for instance the presence of coilocytes where there are wrinkled raisinoid shaped nuclei with a perinuclear halo. And then the other changes that you may see includes for instance elevated nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So if we have a cell that has this big a nucleus, as cells become more dysplastic, the nuclear size will increase. And so this is considered as elevated nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. And then the other changes include increased number of mitotic figures, as well as change in size, shape, and orientation of cells. So depending on the type of findings that we see on histology, then we would consider it whether it's an atypical squamous cells, whether it's a low-grade intraepithelial lesion, LSIS, which corresponds to CIN1, or whether it's a high-grade intraepithelial lesion, HSIL, which is considered as CIN2 or 3. Now, the last one I would like to mention is the timing for cervical cancer screening. So the screening should start at 21 years of age. So if you're reading some of the older books, they say that you should start three years after the onset of the sexual activity. But now the new guidelines say that you should start at 21 years of age regardless of the age of the initiation of sexual activity. So once again, for the cervical screening, you start at 21 years of age regardless of the initiation of the sexual activity. And so in patients that are 21 to 30 years of age, you would use the PAP smear testing every three years and then likewise in patients 30 to 65 years of age you would continue the pap smear testing every three years unless the results are abnormal or alternatively you could do hpv testing as well as the pap smear and so instead you can do it every five years now that you have also included, included the HPV testing for the subtypes that are involved in the cervical infection. And so after the age of 65, if there is three consecutive negative pap smears, or alternatively, if there are two consecutive co-tests that are negative in the past 10 years, then you would no longer need to screen for these patients. And so note that these guidelines that I provided you was with the assumption that every one of these tests were normal. So if the pap smears was normal, then you had to do it every three years. On the other hand, if any one of these tests were abnormal, then you will have to do additional tests. Like for instance, you may have to repeat some of these co-tests and also consider ordering a colposcopy. And so the guideline and the algorithm for which you will have to do for an abnormal test is beyond the scope of this video and the step one exam. But if you're planning on taking step two or step three in the future, it's very important for you to be familiar with those guidelines. And that concludes our discussion of the HPV infection and the cervical cancer.